Let's pray. We're going to get into the Word together. I'm really excited what God has for us this morning. Father in heaven, thank you for your Word. And God, we ask that you would be with us. And as we study it, Lord, as we look through these verses, as we discuss these issues of heart, and Lord, we look at what it is to have a gracious spirit, to be loving and kind to those that are around us. Lord, I just ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit into the church, that Lord, the church would be a place where you are known because your people know you and your people make you known by the way they behave in this culture and by the way they behave towards one another. And so Lord, fill us with your spirit now and teach us in Jesus' name, amen. Now, we've been going through the Gospel of Mark. We've been taking a verse-by-verse -verse look, and we've been in Mark chapter 7. We were in Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 6 last week. And, and as we were there last week, one of the things that we discovered and we began to talk about was the critical, fault-finding spirit that we find in the Pharisees and how they were looking for fault. And as they looked for fault, how Jesus said to them, you know what, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, you hypocrites. For with your lips you speak of God, but your heart is far from him. In vain you worship God because you've replaced the word of God with the commandments of men. And, and so the idea that the uh, critical spirit is an unbiblical and a sinful issue was made very, very clear to us in th that passage of Scripture. Well, one of the things we didn't have the opportunity to do was talk about how do we go from having a critical spirit to having a gracious spirit. How do we make that change? How do we do that? And you know what? I think we need to talk about that. So this morning, our message is entitled, Cultivating a Gracious Spirit. And our first verse we're going to look at this morning is in Luke chapter 1, verse 37. And you can turn there. We're going to look at it in just a few minutes. A couple things that we have to understand is that the passage of Mark chapter 7 really is a passage about heart issues. Because ultimately the conclusion of the passage, it's, it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but what comes out of a man, for what comes out of a man is what was in his heart. And so there are heart issues. Because there are heart issues in our life, one of those things that we have to recognize is often our heart is a place that is has stony ground. It has rocks in it. It's got weeds in it. It's not always the best place for change unless we go in and we cultivate it. So one of those things that we have to recognize and that we're looking at doing this morning is looking at the Word and saying, God, what do we have to do to go from having a critical spirit to having a gracious spirit? What do we have to do? Well, the first thing we have to recognize is we have to go ahead and put the plow into the ground of our heart and allow the Word of God to begin to work out issues that are in the way. Because what happens is we seek to have change in our life, but we don't do the cultivating of our heart in order to allow something new to grow. See, sometimes we're just in habit. We're in a place where nothing is changing because we're not doing the hard work on the hard heart in order to make a heart that's fruitful for change. And so my goal this morning as we go through the lesson is that we would leave today with a few very practical steps on how to move in our own life from a critical spirit to a gracious spirit and how to help others also have victory in this area as we help them move from a place of being critical and unloving to a place of being gracious and loving. Because remember, church, we are not known by our judgment towards one another. We are known by our, say it, love for one another. You didn't seem like you knew the answer to the question. The church is known by our love for one another, right? So I want you to say it with me. We're known by our love for one another, not our criticism or our judgment of one another. And so we have to understand that we, we are coming to a place of desiring to cultivate our heart that we might plant the seeds of graciousness and love in removing the critical heart, in removing that critical spirit uh, from our actions. See, the critical fault-finding spirit is really a heart issue. And what happens when we have a heart like that is it steals joy from everything that isn't perfect, and it steals joy from everyone who falls short of those expectations. Anybody
anybody in the room perfect? No. If you think you're perfect, you're not. Because there is going to be somebody that has a, a, a level of perfection or expectation that you can't meet. You have to understand, none of us are perfect. And because none of us are perfect, we can't meet that perfect expectation. Now, there is a, there's a teaching out there in the church. It's called sinless perfection. It's the idea that we get to the place where we become perfect in this life. Uh, the Prince of Preachers, C.H. Spurgeon, uh, Charles Spurgeon, he was confronted by a man who said, well, I have reached the place of sinless perfection. I no longer sin, to which Charles Spurgeon responded by throwing a pitcher of water in the man's face. And as the man cursed at Charles Spurgeon, <laughs> Charles just said, so how's that working for you? Because the reality is there, is, there are none of us that are perfect. And see, a critical spirit can be a ravenous poison that comes and devours honest effort, loving gestures, and good intentions of every kind. And what happens is that poison comes into relationships, and it touches and destroys relationships. Why? Because it's impossible to reach those kind of standards when they're set. And the pressure of reaching those standards is too heavy to bear. And relationships between people, they crumble because eventually people just stop trying to reach this level of perfection. See, criticalism, the idea of being judgmental of people and being critical of people in, in a critical spirit is a pharisaical behavior. And we don't want to have that. And so we need to be those who are going to move to a place of victory over this issue in our lives. So how are we going to do that? Well, let's talk about it. There's the first thing I want you to realize is there's really good news. The really good news is there is a way to have victory if we have a critical attitude or a judgmental attitude. We can have victory over that. By the way, it is often a slow and difficult process, much like preparing ground for seed. To go into ground that is hard, that is full of rocks, that's full of seed, weeds, and things like that, you've got to go in, you've got to take in the time, and you've got to work that ground. The same thing happens for us. Listen, out of the abundance of our heart, the mouth, our mouth speaks. And so if we're critical from our mouth, there's something going on in our heart. So we, we've got to change the heart issue if we're going to change the mouth and the mind issue. And so we want to change the issue of our heart. We get into a place of habit. As a culture, we are in a habit of tearing people down, of criticizing and griping. It's called social media, by the way. People are out there in the world today, and they're criticizing, and they're tearing people down, and they're griping, and they have become noxious weeds to our souls. Not only that, but they become a noxious weed into the church environment. Just like the Pharisees were in their time, so then also in the church we can have that same attitude where we've gone to tearing people down instead of building people up. We are no longer commending people, but we're criticizing them. We're not grateful anymore. We're grumbling all the time. But there's a good news. It's not impossible to change. It's not an impossible thing to change. It might feel that way, but you can change. And I'm going to share with you why we know we can change. Because the scripture says in Luke chapter 1 verse 37, For with God nothing will be impossible. Right now, if there is a change that you need in your heart, in your life, you need to know something that with God it is possible. For with God nothing will be impossible. So if we or someone we love is struggling with a critical attitude or a critical spirit, there is help and there is hope, and it can be found in God. Now, how many of you, just by show of hands, have ever had a season in your life where you have had a critical attitude? Please raise your hand. Okay, um, some of you didn't raise your hand. How many of you were teenagers? Then you've all had that season, right? You got to the point where you figured you knew everything. Parents were stupid. You were 13, figured you could run the world, huh? We, we all get in that place. And you know what happens? Unless we're corrected, unless somebody points it out, we get into that habit and we start habits that begin a critical spirit that can last for a lifetime because we are tearing people down, criticizing and griping, and we are no longer in that place of being gracious to other people. And so we need to be in a place to say, okay, I want to prepare the ground of my heart. 
I want to change my heart issue that I might change my whole attitude, my whole outlook. So here's the number one thing that you want, I want you to take with you about changing from a critical to a gracious spirit. And so what do we do to cultivate that gracious spirit? Number one, here it is. The number one thing we have to do is we have to acknowledge that a critical spirit is sinful. We have to acknowledge that. You cannot come to me after the message and go, Pastor Ty, you don't understand. God has given me the gift of being critical of people. You, you can't, it is not a spiritual gift, okay? You can't say, well, I have the gift of being blunt and rude. You can't say that. That's not a gifting. <laughs> it's sinful. How do we know it's sinful? Because Jesus said to the Pharisees, you talk about God with your lips, but your heart is far from him. In vain you worship him because you've replaced the commandment of God with the commandment and doctrine of men. You do not know God. You are far from God even though you speak of God. It is a sinful issue. If you want to dig deep into that, it was the message that we had last week. We really looked into that very specifically. So you can grab a copy, you can look at that. But please acknowledge this right now. That's the number one thing. You want to change your heart from being critical to being gracious? Real simple, acknowledge that that critical spirit is sinful. Now if we do that, it leads us to our second thing. And please write this down. Our second thing is that we have to confess and repent of that critical spirit. These are action steps. Acknowledge that it's a sin then confess the sin and repent of the sin because the sin in which we are committing when we are critical grieves the Holy Spirit of God, which is grieving God. It's grieving the presence of God within us. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 says this, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it might impart grace to the hearer. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. He says that every word that proceeds from us should be good for necessary edification and it should impart grace to the hearer. Now, I want you to think about this in a way of saying, okay, my words, the things that I say and do if God were looking at or saying the things that I was saying, would they be pleasing to him or not pleasing to him? So let me just ask it like this. Husbands, if God were watching you say the things that you say to your wife, would he say those things are good and uplifting and gracious or are they critical? Wives, this, this road goes two ways. Wives, what does God think of the things that you say to your husband? Kids, young adults, what does God think about the things you say to your parents or to your brothers and sisters, your classmates, moms and dads? What does God think about the things you say to your kids? Dads, you need to remember something. The Word of God tells us that we are not to exasperate or frustrate our children. And having a critical spirit can do that very thing. That doesn't mean we don't correct them. It doesn't mean we don't tell them, look, you need to clean up your room. And it doesn't mean our kids aren't going to say, you're being critical. I'm saying, no, you're being a slob. You don't have a floor. <laughs> the whole, you have to understand that, that what we're talking about is a critical fault-finding, pharisaical spirit that we see throughout the Gospels that we're not supposed to have towards one another. And we need to think about the things that we're saying to one another. Church, what are we saying to one another in the church? What are we saying to other believers? What are we saying to people in the community? What do they see coming from our heart? Because it's not what goes into us, church, that defiles us. It's what comes out of us that defiles us. And so we have to understand and allow these, this idea of thinking about what I'm doing and so if I'm saying things I shouldn't be saying, if I'm saying things that are inappropriate, then I need to confess and repent of those things. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says this. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, 
It says, if we confess our sins, so there's, there's, it's an if-then issue, right? If. So we have to be confessing. We need to be a people that are confessing our sin. And it said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful. Now, by the way, I appreciate the scripture says that when we are faithless, he is faithful. Praise God for that. He is faithful to forgive us, but it also says he's just. Why is he just to forgive our sins? I'm going to clarify why. He is just to forgive us our sins, not in the way he goes, oh, it's not a big deal. Yes, sin's a big deal. It was such a big deal that Jesus Christ came and died on the cross. He who knew no sin became sin for you. God became man, went to the cross, and died for you that God, when you confess, can be faithful and just to forgive you of sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness because your sin and your unrighteousness was laid upon Jesus Christ and he suffered your punishment. He took your place. That is why he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But please understand, it begins with this, if we confess our sins. So what is it to confess a sin? Confession is agreeing with God that it's wrong. It's not that hard, is it? You could put that in your notes. You could take that one home. Confession is agreeing with God that it's wrong. Repentance, on the other hand, is this. Repentance is turning away and you don't do it anymore. You with me? So I'm going to agree with God that the critical attitude is wrong and then I'm going to turn away from it and I will not do it anymore. Now, most people don't understand that. In fact, most people don't understand repentance. Let me help you with that. Repentance is we don't do it anymore. I want you to say that with me. Can you do that? Repentance is we don't do it anymore. Now, I'm not sure you believe yourselves yet, but repentance is we don't do it anymore. Now, here's the deal. If I confess to God and I agree with God that what I'm doing is wrong and then I come to a place where I say I'm going to repent but I continue to do it I need to ask you a question did you really agree with God that it was wrong if you didn't repent of it because if you agree with God that it's wrong and you keep doing it there is something wrong in the math how many of you are with me right now If we agree with God and his scripture that something we're doing is wrong, I confess. I agree, God, that is wrong. Then I'm going to repent, which means I'm not going to do it anymore. And I continue to do it. I have a repentance problem for sure, but I can guarantee you I probably have a greater confession problem than I have a repentance problem. Because if I really came to the place where I agreed with God that this is wrong, because God, you are holy and your word says it's wrong, and so I know it's wrong, then I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm going to be in a different place. Now, we all struggle, so this brings us to our third point. Our third point is this, is that once we acknowledge that it's sin, and we confess, we agree with God that it's wrong, we repent, which means we're not going to do it anymore, then we ask God for help. How many of you have stuff in your life you need some help with right now? Yeah, God is here to help you. You ask God for help. How how do you ask God for help? First of all, you say, okay, God, I agree with you. This is wrong. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to do everything in my life to turn away from it. Now, would you help me stay turned away from it? You know, one of the greatest ways you can do that is you can ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit of God. Ask the Holy Spirit to come and fill and invade every area of your life. Say, God, fill me, change me, be one with me, and help me. So ask God for his power through the Holy Spirit. That's one. Here's the second thing. Wash yourself with the water of the word. See, remember, it's a heart issue. If your heart is heart, this is known, the water of the word, the washing of the water of the word. If you are not in devotions every day, if you are not reading your Bible every day, you are not really asking God for help. Because when you ask God for help and you say, God, help me, fill me with your spirit, and you read the word of God, the word of God is empowered by the spirit of God, and it washes our heart, and it softens the ground of our heart. The word of God does a work in us that is so deep, we do not even recognize it. But we come to God, we say, God, help me, so fill me with your Holy Spirit, and then we commit to reading his word, and his word washes over our heart, and his word changes how we view things, and how we view life, and how we work through things. And so we ask God for help, but there's another thing that we can do in the idea of getting help. 
We are part of the body of Christ. Be accountable to one another. Have brothers and sisters that you're part of. Be in fellowship. Be in a house-to-house group. Be with people. And you know what? If you're struggling with something, have people in your life you can ask and go, man, was, 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 I, was, I, really, was I being too critical there? Was that too critical? And you know what they're going to do? They're going to look at you and go, yes, because if you have to ask, right? But then you have a group of people that you can say, oh, man, man, I need to repent. Would you pray for me? I oh, mean, I, I need to not do that anymore. I, I need some help, man. I, I'm being critical in this area. I've got to stop that. And you know what? You have those people in your life. Guys, we ask for help. We ask God for help. We ask for his spirit and we read the word and we let the word of God come and encourage and strengthen us and help us. And we reach out to one another and we say, would you help me in this area? Because I want to be a a man or I want to be a woman that loves people, that has a gracious spirit, that is not pharisaical in the way that they view people and view ministry and view life. And so we become a people that are, are asking for help. But now... We come to three specific areas we looked at just a little bit. Remember I mentioned something about what really creates a critical spirit? There's three specific things that that do that. It's a thanklessness, a selfishness, and an insecurity in our life that can really lead us to being in a place of being critical of everything and everyone. And so what we have to do is we have to back that up and do the opposite. So here is the fourth thing that we need to realize this morning is this, is that we need to be a thankful people. We need to be thankful. Turn your grumbling into gratefulness. Be grateful for the things that you have in this life. And there's always, by the way, there is always something to be thankful for in every situation. There's always something to be thankful for in every situation. Always. But we need to get in the habit of looking for those things because we have trained ourselves as a culture to be unsatisfied with everything. Come on, advertisers advertise to make us unsatisfied. Did you know that? Look, the grass might be greener on the other side, but you still got to mow it, you still got to edge it, you got to fertilize it, and by the time you get your hands on it, it's not going to be the same green. We are all in a place where we have become part of a culture that is very unsatisfied, very critical, very wanting of everything that we do not have, and we need to create new habits. But it takes effort to make new habits. Now, I need to share something with you. Musicians in the room are going to understand this. And so I'm going to explain it. Most, most of you don't understand this if you've never played music before. But here's the thing. When a musician makes a mistake, One time, it's a habit. That's all it takes is one time in that environment to create a bad habit. You've now made a mistake. Do you realize how many times it takes to fix the mistake that you made one time? Ten times, perfectly. You make one mistake, you have to do it now ten times correctly in order to fix the mistake. Here's the problem. When I was in music school, and I was going to school, I would go and I would work on a piece for an entire week. I would play a wrong note for an entire week. I didn't just play it one time. I played it hundreds of times incorrectly. So it literally became part of my physical being. It's the idea of muscle memory. That's how my body now knew how to do it. And so I'd come to my lesson, and my professor would go, did you not look at the music? That's not what that note is. I'm like, it sounds okay. He says, it's a wrong note, which makes the chord wrong. It's wrong. You've got to go fix it. I would spend weeks playing one passage over and over and over trying to get it right ten times in a row to fix the error. I want you to think about where we are in life. If we have in, in such a habit where we are no longer being a grateful people, how hard is it going to be for us? We've got to put some effort into this to create new habits of being thankful. Come on, as a culture, we have Thanksgiving once a year, but shouldn't we be thankful every day? Right? Church, should we be thankful every day? Yes. Absolutely. Why are we thankful every day? Let's start with the fact that we're going to heaven. It doesn't matter what everything else, if everything else falls apart in your life, you still got Jesus. Did you know that? Because he is faithful. 
You've still got the Lord. And so the, the idea of creating new habits of gratitude, eventually that becomes your default. And when that becomes your default, those negative ideas don't have a place to rest. And eventually gratitude moves in more permanently. Now, Psalm chapter 100, verse 4. I love this. It says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. So this is what it should look like when we come to church. Did you guys know that? We should enter in with what? Most of you got it. We enter in with what? And into his courts with? That's right. But you know what? You sounded like, this is what you sounded like. We come in with thanksgiving. We come in with praise. No, no, no. Do you understand? You're going to heaven. Church, you're going to heaven. How thankful are you that you're going to heaven, right? So, okay, yeah. So there we go. That's more. That's praise. There you go, right? We come in and we come in where? We come into the court with what? Thanksgiving. And we come in with praise. And we lift him up because he is worthy to be praised. That's our default as the church. It's not critical. It's thanksgiving and it's praise. Why? Because he goes on and he says, Be thankful to him and bless his holy name or bless his name for the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 20 says, giving thanks always for you and all sorry, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to be giving thanks to God in all things. Which means that's our default. In every situation there's something to give thanks to God for. By the way, let me just back up to some simple things. You got up this morning, your legs worked, your arms worked, your fingers worked, your eyes worked. You can taste, you can talk, you can see. Do you think about that for a minute? The fact that your body works, you should just be thankful. Because some people don't have that. There is always something to be thankful for. That should be who we are, a thankful people. Boy, that begins to take away our critical attitude really fast. Here's the next thing. This is the fifth thing for this morning. It's the idea of being selfless, being others-centered. We are a people that are to be unselfish. In other words, an unselfish heart thinks of others rather than self. It gives instead of takes. It serves and instead of demands to be served. We are a people that go, oh man, that person is struggling. How can I help them? How can I love them in the name of God that God might be glorified? How can I do that for them? See, in, in other words, instead of being critical of what they're doing or their struggle, we go, how can I help them in their struggle? Because that's what I need to be. I need to be selfless, not selfish. For uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 4 says, let each of you look not, not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let me read that again. Philippians 2, 4. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. We look out for other people. When you come into the church, you need to know that you are loved by the people that are around you. Because the people around you are loved by God. And those people in turn love you. Because church, we are known by our love for one another. Not our criticism of one another. Not our judgment of one another. And so we need to remember that. This, that is the next thing. The sixth thing is this. Number six. We need to fully grasp this truth. We need to remember that we are loved and we need to remember who loves us. Church, do you remember who loves you? Jesus loves you. And you know what? There are t-shirts and bumper stickers. Remember those? Smile. Jesus loves you. Or smile. God loves you. And it became such a commonplace. It was up on billboards and people just started to ignore it. Have you thought about how beautiful the reality is that God actually really loves you. And he loves you with an undying, unfailing, eternal, perfect love. And in that perfect love, he sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for you, to take all of your sins, that if you believe upon Jesus Christ, you will be saved and enter into eternity and enter into the embrace of the everlasting arms of everlasting perfect love. I mean, that is the God who loves you. Do you know that God loves you? I hope you do, and if you know that God loves you, this is the, and by the way, if you leave with nothing else, if I've lost you at some point, and you leave with nothing else but what I'm about to share with you, that's okay. Please listen to this. 
God's love is not dependent on our ability to earn his favor. God's love is not dependent on your or my ability to earn his favor. We can stop measuring ourselves against everything and everyone else. We can stop trying to find our self-worth in others or in what other people think, but we can find our self-value, our true value in who we are in Christ because it is not self-esteem that is important. It is what God esteems who we are. It is God esteems towards us. It is his love for us. It is how God views us that's important. And when we view ourselves the way God views us, we know that we are loved. Now, when we know that we are loved, it can help us do the seventh thing this morning and throughout the rest of our lives. And this one's really, really important. If you haven't taken notes up to this point, you want to take notes on this one. You want to write this one down. Write it on something. Write it on your hand. Borrow a pen from somebody. This one is really, really important, okay? So if you want to come to a place where you want to move from that, a critical spirit to a gracious spirit, which is, by the way, what we are supposed to have as the church, when people walk in, they should recognize grace and love in this place. Let me, let me just share this with you. Are you ready? It's important. You ready to write it down? Lower your expectations. We laugh at it, but it's true, isn't it? Lower your expectations. If you set these high, unobtainable expectations for humanity, for other people, for your spouse, your kids, your neighbors, your family. If you do that, you will always be disappointed and you'll always find yourself struggling with this idea of being critical of them. Just lower your expectations. You will not be disappointed. You won't. By the way, when I'm talking about lowering your expectations, I'm not talking about lowering the expectations of the word of God. I want to clarify that. This is never lowered. This is God's holy standard. What I'm talking about is the stupid human stuff. The, 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 you know what I'm talking about? Like, oh, well, we should be like this, or we should be like that, or your church culture says this. or church. No, 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 no. Let's lower your expectations. People are sinners. We must come to a place where we acknowledge that we are all works in progress. When we know that we're works in progress, we give room to people that are still works in progress. We are all under construction. I hope you understand that. I am not a finished work. One day I'll be a finished work. Do you know when that is? When you're throwing dirt on the box. You guys know that, right? That's when I'm a finished work. When you're throwing dirt on the box, that's when I'm done. Because that's when I'm with the Lord. That's when I'm done. Until that time, I'm a work in progress. And you know what? We can give more grace to others when we realize how much grace that we've been given. And you know what? Everybody falls short of the weird standards that we set up of legalism because that's where the Pharisees have gone and that's the thing that we're really learning as we're going through the gospel of the things to avoid. We don't want to do that. See, the opposite of the critical spirit is the gracious spirit. Now, people have a gracious spirit. There's four things that we can really learn about them. And so I want to share those things with you. And I want to share these four things with you so you can kind of gauge in your own life, where am I at? Am I still critical? Am I gracious? Are there things I'm still working on? Remember, when you lower your expectations, everybody's a work in progress. If they're going to extend you grace, you extend them grace. Number one is this. Is people who have a gracious spirit have a deep understanding of God's mercy and goodness. We really understand that God's mercy and goodness, that God is merciful and he's good and he loves us. The second thing that we have is this, is that, that we're quick to recognize our own need for God's mercy. We recognize I need God's mercy. You need God's mercy. The third thing is that we come to this place that we are, we're willing to extend that mercy because we know who, how merciful God is. We know that we need it, so we extend it to other people. How many of you know you need God's mercy? How many of you, by being honest, have been in a place where you have not extended it? <laughs> Isn't that sad of us, right? It's sad. It's hard to admit, but it's true. And so we need to be those people. That should be our default as the church because we are known by our love for one another. And so the fourth thing is this, is because, because we're willing to extend that same mercy, the reason is, is that we are thankful on how God has dealt with us and with them. We're thankful that God shows mercy to us and to them and how God has been merciful to us. We show mercy to other people. 
And, but one of the reasons we do this is because we are well aware that we need to treat others in large part in the way that God has treated us. For James chapter 2, verse 13 says this, For judgment without mercy, sorry, for judgment is without mercy to the one who shows no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Let me share that one more time. James 2, 13. For judgment is without mercy to the one who shows no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. I want to reword that in a way for you to maybe understand it a little bit differently. It says, so you must show mercy to others, or God will not show mercy to you when he judges you, but the person who shows mercy can stand without fear at the judgment. Because we have been in that place where we have not been critical or judgment of other, we, we have not been judging other people. We've understood what God has done to us, and we extend that to other people. We as the church... It's very clear who we're to be. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 says, Therefore, as the elect of God, that's us, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. That's who we're supposed to be. Church, that, that's who we are. That's who we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be a people that are tender-hearted towards one another. We're to be the church. We're not supposed to be those critical people that are setting inappropriate standards. We're supposed to see other people in the way they truly are. They're, they make a mistake, we're going to show mercy to them. We make a mistake, we will expect the same thing. Because when people come in here, they expect to meet with Jesus. Now let me sh share something with you. Jesus has sent you as his representative to the lost that walk in this building. And because of that, they should see Jesus. Listen, if they're looking for Jesus and they, go, they hear about a church, oh, they, they talk about a God of love, but they come in and they don't see love. If they say, oh, they talk about a God of mercy, and they come in and they don't see mercy. If they say, well, they talk about a God of forgiveness, and they come in and they don't see forgiveness. We are doing something wrong. But when they come into God's house and they see God's people functioning as they should, the way that he functions towards us, love, mercy, grace, forgiveness, compassion, kindness, then they know they're in God's house and they will be forever changed because they've been touched by the bride of Christ. We touch people as the bride of Christ and we represent Jesus. Listen, church doesn't have to be complicated, but we make it that way, don't we? Do you guys know we do? We make church complicated. Culturally, we do that. I'm a Calvary Chapel guy. I'm part of the Jesus movement. I'm a young part of the Jesus movement, but I'm part of the Jesus movement. And, and, and because of that, I'm a Calvary Chapel pastor. And, and I, I, as a Calvary Chapel pastor, i got to share something with you. What we do is not complicated. Jesus, it's his church. That's, that's it. Jesus is his church. And we seek to glorify Jesus in everything that we do. But Acts 2.42 tells us four simple things that we do. We study the word. We fellowship. We pray. And we eat together. We used to be called Calorie Chapel, but we had to change it. I'm in recovery. But, but, but here's the thing. You got to understand. We get around the word of God and we're going to study the word of God. We will never compromise on the word of God. We fellowship with one another because we love one another and we need to be intimate with one another. We need to know what's going on so we can pray with one another and confess our sins to one another and be strengthened together as the body of Christ. And as we, the healthier we are, the more people that we can draw into that beauty. We can draw into that love and into that grace. And we pray because I'm going to tell you right now, since we have started praying, God has been moving. When there's a prayer meeting, church, show up. Six o'clock on Saturday night, show up. We gotta find a bigger space here pretty quick. You show up. God's doing amazing things because we're a praying church, and we pray. And we need to continue to pray. We have communion together. We, we seek the Lord in that way. We break bread. We fellowship. We pray. We study the word of God. This is the things we do. We eat together. But then there's another thing that's really, really important. It's, it's Acts 1.8. Acts 1.8 keeps it really simple. Acts 1.8, it's the idea of being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, look, wait in Jerusalem until you're filled with the Holy Spirit. 
that you might be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, that's really important. We're filled with the Holy Spirit of God. By the way, the Spirit of God is still active and functioning in the church. The gifts of the Spirit are still for today. God is still working. God is still moving, and the power of God is still very alive in the church. And so when we seek to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, we seek God and his Holy Spirit that we might do that. But I want to put it in an interesting context for you. That verse was shared on a mountaintop in Jerusalem. And so Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Idaho is the ends of the earth. In context, we are there. We are them that are to be reaching our area with the mission of Jesus Christ. It's who we are. We should be reaching people with the love of Jesus. Let's be loving Jesus. Let's be pouring out our love on people. And you know what? Then Acts, sorry, then uh, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. The idea that we are all being built up as the body of Christ to be more like Jesus every day. And if we're doing that, we're asking for the Holy Spirit, we're reaching out to people, we're in the word, we're in fellowship, we're in prayer, we're taking communion, we're breaking bread, we're having baptisms, people are getting saved, we're doing it right, and we're doing it simple. We're not making it complicated, we're not adding to it. Let's keep it simple, church, because that's what God's called us to do. Father in heaven, thank you for the word. And I ask that you would be with us as we study you would encourage us. And that, Lord, as we end our service today, as we, as we worship, as we give of ourselves to one another, as we, Lord, pray for one another, as we move into that place of, of being the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, I ask that you would move amongst us by your Spirit. That you would help us be the men and women that you've called us to be that you would help us to be those that are full of love and grace, compassion and mercy, that represent who you are to a world that desperately needs to know you. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Water Springs Church. Check us out at watersprings.net. And if this video blessed you, please click the subscribe button. God bless.